Um, so, so David, I've made you the host, and now you can start sharing your screen. Great. Yeah, yeah it worked. So everyone can see it okay? It's all good? Absolutely, Great. yes. All right. So as, as Victoria mentioned, I have a great interest in climate change. And it's funny how you always talk about it as a global thing. It's a global climate change. The average temperature is increasing over the whole world. But um, I think it's really interesting to look at your own area. So that's what we're going to focus on tonight is <clears throat> our own local climate and then going on a bit of a time travel, going to the past, the present, and the future. And um, as was mentioned in um, the material you received, I've been involved in a study in Burnaby where we're looking at making a park more climate resilient. So that's the, the future bit. Um, so I'm going to do this talk in four different scenes. So the first, it, it is in order by time. So the first scene is the ice age we experienced here in Metro, Metro Vancouver a uh, long time ago. And then um, the scene two really is bogs. And Victoria already mentioned that our one forest has a bog in it. And I, I really love bogs. There's not that many weeds to study there, but at least there's a lot of other things to look at. And ironically, the Langley Field Naturalist, who I am a member of, as Victoria mentioned, they have a talk on bogs tonight that I'm missing because, because I'm here. So um, I'll just have to find out later how that went. Um, so the third scene is the now. So there's this thing called the Anthropocene period that we're in now. I'll explain that. And then fourthly, talking about this excellent, uh, amazing experience we've had working in Burnaby's Central Park. So to give you the grand historical context here, we're going back 23 million years in five epochs here. Um, I'm going to use my mouse here. That's I'm not really, really good at Zoom yet, and the best thing I have is this little mouse. But starting off here, uh, 23 million, you're in the Miocene, and then the uh, Pliocene, Plastocene, Holocene. But the, the, really thing, the one thing I really want to point out is the Anthropocene. And there was a Nobel Prize winning chemist who came up with this name, and it really relates to climate change. But... When I talk, I'm going to go back into the Ice Age as well to really give, give us the full picture of climate over time. So this is the uh, winner of this prize uh, for inventing the term Anthropocene. Um, if you know the meaning of words, it's, it has to do with people impacting things. And what he points out here is he's putting it at the 18th century at which point the global effect of human activities have been noticeable. When you look at the glacial ice cores and greenhouse gases in there, and also the invention of the steam engine. Um, so that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that's what Anthropocene means. But going back before the Anthropocene, we had the Ice Age here in Metro Vancouver. So. A few million years ago is when the ice first came. And now you really have to use your imagination because we only ever see a little bit of ice. Like the best example nearby is Mount Baker. If you look up at Mount Baker, you can see some uh, glacial activity there. But there was massive glaciation covering most of the continent, kind of going back and forth. The last one came 120,000 years ago. And then before um, the glaciers finally left, we were buried by um, several kilometers of ice. So it always boggles my mind to think of that. So as I said, the best way to picture it, this is one of my favorite trails on Mount Baker here. You can see the ice a little bit there. And then this is 15,000 years ago. Then suddenly, as it melted, you go through the sequence here, um, there was a lot of water. So a lot of melt water. And that kind of leads into our next story of the bogs. But you can picture after the ice came water and a lot of um, sediments 
And of course, the formation of the Fraser River, which I'll be talking about a lot here. But the world on ice was a very different place. Um, the ocean temperatures were much colder and sea levels were lower. Right now we're concerned about sea levels rising because ice is melting, the ice we have left. But back then a lot of the water was taken up in ice. And the natural organisms that we all love as naturalists were all buried in ice. Um, you couldn't find them until the melting. So getting to the melting. So melting ice making beautiful bogs. And this is a view up the Fraser River here picture I took recently where you can see the uh, ice we still have in the distance there and I really like this diagram here because I think it illustrates how we got bogs in our area quite well if you remember the ice melted and the big river formed but all up and down the the river there's these bogs many many different bogs and of course if you go out there now and go along the river you won't see too many of them because we have developed and taken them, a lot of them away. Um, but historically, this is called historic peatlands. You can see they're all up and down the river. And um, I'm going to do a tour up the river here of what we can still see of these bogs. So I'm going to start with the big one near the mouth of the river, the Burns Bog, and then go up to Surrey Bend. And then the Langley Bog, and of course I'm at Trinity Western University very close to Langley, so we've done some research there. And then finally end up at this Glen Valley Bog up here. And I realized as I was making the presentation, this is a very biased presentation because of where I am. I'm south of the Fraser, and unfortunately <laughs> I'm speaking to you north of the Fraser, which just means I need to get to know the similar territory north of the Fraser, You'll just have to apply it to your area. So these bogs formed after the glaciers left. The glaciers melted and produced silt accumulating along the Fraser, forming the delta. And water pooled along the shores and plant material accumulated. So peat is accumulated dying or dead plant material. Um, so that's around 6,000 years after. And then after another thousand years, something else appeared, which is probably one of my favorite plants in the world. And you can see I put it in the background here. We'll see a better picture in a moment. Um, this is sphagnum moss, which became dominant in the boggy areas. And this led to an even greater accumulation of organic matter because sphagnum moss actually makes conditions acidic, which makes it hard for things to decompose. And that really is getting into the present and the future because once you have a bog formed with sphagnum moss, it's very slow to release the carbon. So this picture is from 1921, and in many ways I wish we could go back to that time, because, <laughs> of course, Metro Vancouver was very different then. But what I really want to point out here is the peat bogs in this map. So you can see all these areas here. So you can see the peat bogs were much more extensive. I mean, we still had... Burns bog down there, but um, there's a lot more. And this story written by a Swedish scientist, I think, tells it quite well. And one thing you'll notice here, he's just walking along. I mean, it's partly because he's a scientist, a naturalist, um, but it's partly because people didn't have much transportation in those days. We didn't have these big bridges. So he says, having passed the southern suburbs of Vancouver and reached the top of the hills south of the town, a wonderful and wide view of the Fraser River Delta is obtained. As seen from the map, a considerable part of the area is occupied by bogs. Of course, you wouldn't see that now unless you happen to be looking where Burns Bog is. Most of these, however, are strongly influenced by drainage and cultivation along the margins. And in order to give immediate idea of the vegetation of a bog still exists in its original state, the studies made on the little bog somewhat south are presented first of all. So um, he's looking at all these bogs and he's tramping around in them. Very different world back in just 1927. But he, he notes that things are already changing due to human activities. So here's what this big bog that we have left and even Burns Bog as we'll talk about is not. 
what it once was, but it is quite large and quite beautiful, um, as you can see in this beautiful photograph here. And how it formed, um, going back to our 10,000 years ago when the ice melted, had a lot of water beside, you know, on the delta there. And then this vegetation came in. And then more and more vegetation until the sphagnum came in and you had like this true sphagnum bog. And then you had this interesting phenomena. The bog is like a sponge. All that peat just forms a sponge and actually goes above the, the surface level. And so that's called a raised bog, which is Burns bog. And during that time, back, you know, thousands of years ago, there was many First Nations uses for the uh, berries that were there, like cloudberries, cranberries, blueberries, uh, the deer and the bear and ducks were hunted. Um, and there's also a lot of infrastructure. Um, and they use plants like sundews, sphagnum mosses, and Labrador tea for medicinal purposes. So a lot of uses of this burns bog back then and then different uses in the colonial period. The peat mining began in the 1930s and that didn't end until 1984. So you can imagine during that time, a lot of peat was removed and the damage is still felt today. And then there's a lot of other things going on like agricultural conversion, uh, neighboring industrial and urban regions uh, had their impacts and the Burns bog itself got isolated. A, a bog, remember how it formed, is connected to the river. So if it's connected to the river, it's a more vital kind of bog. And there's been a disconnection through a lot of the roadways. And then the Vancouver landfill happened to go in the bog. <laughs> Not the best place for a landfill, but um, fortunately there are architects and engineers who've tried to lower these risks, but yet we do have that landfill there. And this shows you how uh, this recent project, the uh, Highway 17, um, cut off the, the bog really from the river. Um, so the, the flow of water back and forth, I mean, the Fraser River is mostly diked now anyway. So, um, but, uh, but there was damage due to the road building too. As we see here, a lot of the forest at the edge of the bog was cut down at that time just uh, nine years ago. So moving up to the next place along the river, Surrey Bend is a bend in the Fraser River. And there's still some remnant bog there, but it was kind of forgotten. It was just there. Uh, it wasn't preserved as a park until this concept came along. This is the artist kind of concept of putting a park there, but keeping a lot of the bog area intact. So there is a nice boggy area down here. And this park just opened, was opened by Metro Vancouver Parks in 2016. And here you can see the, what I'm talking about, the, the continuity that you want between the Fraser River and the boggy area. So this is very healthy. The more water, basically that's the rule of bogs, more water, the better. And this is one of the largest undiked areas along the Fraser River to this day. So it's a good thing they preserved it. Um, getting to the Langley bog, this is a not very well known bog and a lot of the reason is it's not open to the public. Metro Vancouver does manage it, but because bogs have this large peaty area and you can sink in, um, if you're not careful, um, it's a huge liability concern and there's no real organized trails at the Langley bog. However, if you're lucky, you can get in on an excursion and the Derby Reach Bray Island Parks Association organizes these. And this is one that I led back in 2016 through the edge of, we're at the edge of the bog there in the forested part. Um, so we got into this through a generous grant from the Pacific Parklands Foundation. And we ended up doing a two year study, a very intensive study. We looked at the general characteristics of the bog, the physical characteristics, the hydrology. Um, also, I looked at the weeds, of course, because I'm always in the weeds. And then we also looked at sphagnum recovery. 
so this was the crew in 2010 and this relates to climate change as you can see 2010 was a really really hot summer and these students were just dying out there they tend to do their work in the morning and and go in an air-conditioned place in the afternoon to work on their maps uh, and this is Paul Brown who really led this study at Trinity Western and this is uh, just after we finished the study BC Nature held its conference it was hosted by our Langley Field Naturalist and we had a field trip out to see the bog and so this is the lay of the land so if you remember I talked about the peat mining in Burns Bog it happened here too and you can see the what, what it's created here, there's all these ridges and channels. The ridges are what the machinery left behind. The channels are where the peat got scooped out. So over several decades, they took out a lot of peat and that naturally is gonna affect the bog. So the deepest we measured it, we have these, this big thing to stick in to measure the depth was 5.5 meters. That's still pretty deep. Um, you know, it's over 15 feet, uh, but historically they think it was a lot deeper and of course a lot of it was removed in the peat mining and it also tended to flatten out the bog so it wasn't a raised bog anymore. So a lot of our question was can this bog can be, can it be restored? And it's really neat to see the old peat mining equipment that was left behind. And this is my student that looked at the weeds so what he looked at was the cranberries and you often associate cranberries with bogs because that's where we get our cranberries often planted in wet areas and should I should go back to here what yeah so here you can see these cranberry fields nearby so these are the non-native cranberries and birds eat them and bring them to the native part which has native cranberries so that's really what we were concerned with. How are these two cranberries fighting it out? And what Simon designed here was a diagram to show that the non-native cranberry is winning, unfortunately. Gradually over time, it's starting to take over um, because of certain characteristics it has. Although it tends to be more in the mind part of the bog. So there's still a lot of this Vaccinius oxycoccus, which is the native cranberry. So there's some hope that we could make it a more native cranberry area, but you've got cranberry fields right next to the bog, so it's fighting an uphill battle. Now this, this is the sphagnum. This is the picture I promised to show you. Um, this beautiful moss, and you can see by looking at it how it soaks up all the uh, moisture. And so this other student, Matt, decided to do a, a thesis on trying to improve the sphagnum growth in the Langley bog. So he grew it in, up in the lab and then he put it back here at these uh, quadrats and he put stakes in the ground and we were going to monitor this but um, this is where I have to confess we blew it. Um, we didn't go back. Um, my excuse is we didn't have any funding but maybe that's a poor excuse until eight years later. So eight years later, I got my students out there again, Samit and Delia, and Delia had the exact coordinates where Matt had put his plots and where he'd carefully sowed the seeds of the sphagnum. And we looked and we looked, there was no trace of any stakes and we couldn't tell whether the sphagnum grew back. So it was a lost cause. But it's it was still a beautiful bog and we just marveled at you know, getting to see it and up close, especially the sundew plants. These are these amazing plants that feed on insects with their sticky bits here. Um, so there's a lot of beautiful sundews in that bog. And just yesterday, I heard that uh, Langley, um, that Metro Vancouver is doing some work on monitoring water levels because we decided in our report we really needed to increase the water levels and they haven't been monitored much since that report so um, hopefully there could be help for that bog. Moving up the river to the fourth bog this is the Glen Valley bog and once again you see cranberries are there so there's not much left of the bog except cranberries except 
this amazing little tiny bog that we found. So over here you can see the cranberries up near the river. So once again, it's right near the Fraser River. And this is the Blauico Forest. And Victoria mentioned that I was involved in saving this. Really, the person that saved this was Anne Blau. She's an incredible woman and on behalf of her and together with her family, they uh, have donated a huge amount of money to save this land. It was gonna be developed for lots and now it's 50 acres that the family has gifted us. And you can see there's a gravel pit in the middle. Um, we're, we're getting the gravel pit as well and we're going to restore that gradually over time. But the corner over here is where we made this discovery and uh, the name of this tiny bog is called the Gearhorn Bog. And it's named after Beth Gear and Karen Eichhorn. They named it themselves. It's the beauty of discovering something. They came back and told us about it and we could hardly get them off the ceiling because they think they said, we think we found a bog. And indeed they did. There's a, a spring here, a beautiful spring. Um, and the bog is just this corner of the forest. So the rest of the forest is here. You just have this corner. Not a very large area, it's a remnant of a much larger bog. But Beth was able to find quite a few sphagnum species. In fact, she found six different sphagnum species growing in this tiny remnant bog. So once she found that, we really have focused a lot of research looking at this, looking at other plants. These are two other bog type plants. The uh, Blueberry and Labrador tea. Labrador tea grows in huge profusion at the Burns Bog and the uh, Langley Bog. Then what happened, shortly after we discovered the bog, we discovered there was a, a proposal to remove some peat just north of where the bog was. So we went into the Township Council meeting and fought that, and Ann Blau herself went to the meeting. And sure enough, the proposal was withdrawn and the, the property was sold. In its place was built a house. So <laughs> the peat was not removed, but on the other hand, um, I think this house probably has had some effect on, on the bog just nearby. So we started measuring the water levels using these piezometers placed in the bog. So this is what piezometers are. They just are these tubes you stick into the bog to measure water levels. And unfortunately, the water level goes way down in the summer, as it would for many bogs. And so the hope is hopefully someday we can figure out a way to prevent that from happening. We also looked at the depth of the peat. Even though it's a small remnant bog, it's just as old as the Langley bog. You can see. Um, five meter deep cores we managed to get in. It's a huge effort <laughs> to plunge in the cores and so it's hundreds of years old and here's Lungi just contemplating this ancient peat. It's amazing to think about that. And then Caitlin here took over and looked at what state is the bog in. Um, usually you think nutrient poor that's bad but ombotrophic means that's good for a, a bog that means it's maintaining its acidic characteristics um, as a typical bog. But mineralotrophic is kind of a, a dying bog. Um, and so she measured calcium and closer to the middle, there was lower calcium, which showed that uh, the middle was the best part. Um, but the vegetation indicated that it's gradually becoming a mineralotrophic bog. So we're losing it basically. And we, got Sarah Howie to visit and help us decide what to do next. And she said, you should do a pH map. So Delia, the latest researcher, took that up and uh, did some pH mapping in the bog. And here you can see some of her lovely maps. Um, this is early in the season. You can see a lot of the middle of the bog has a very low pH, which is a good indicator of a typical bog. But as it gets drier over the summer, the pH goes down. So um, another indication, things are not all well. Uh, the Blau family recently donated more money to us to build this boardwalk. So unlike the Langley Bog, you can at least access it. So if you go to the Blau Eco Forest, there's a nice little boardwalk you can go through. And this is a sign that Delia designed that uh, talks about 
the value of sphagnum. And the forest itself is a naturalist paradise. I recently uh, led a tour of the Langley Field Naturalist with physical distancing. We just had a very, very small group. Um, and we saw some, some neat things that evening. Um, and on June 1st, I got this picture of uh, Wilson's warbler there. Um, I heard them a lot as I went to the forest, but um, only this one cooperated. Suddenly he was there and I quickly <laughs> took the picture. But there was another bird much more cooperative this summer. This owl here, he, he is a highly photographed owl. It's a, I think it's a juvenile great horned owl. Um, and here you can see he's just about ahead it with me though. By this time I'd taken about a dozen photographs and he's like, come on, <laughs> what are you doing down there? Can't you leave me alone? So I left him alone after that, but it's a real character. So what are these bogs good for? I've made the point they, they're good at storing carbon. They can store enough carbon apparently to cover 5.4 million cars emissions. This is just Burns bog. Um, they're better at storing carbon than other systems because there isn't as much decomposition. So this is the value of our bogs for our future as far as preventing more climate change to some degree. Um, but there is a sad statement here, though it took sphagnum mosses over 3,000 years to form the Burns bog, human beings have destroyed it, half of it, in the last century. So this, this is saying, you know, a lot of the bog is not what it used to be. Maybe it's about half gone, but we still have it. Uh, there are these highways that I mentioned, um, but fortunately there's a lot of that bog left. And then with all four of these bogs I talked about, there's a need for some kind of restoration. So <laughs> these effects on the bogs really are symptoms of the Anthropocene, which is human manipulation. And you can't help but notice human presence. If you went back to the 1920s, you wouldn't see anything like this in Greater Vancouver. And it's climate also changing. Uh, the the long-term trend, the black line fish spell, follow the black line, uh, it gradually goes down. So we were almost getting towards another ice age. Then suddenly, boom, um, it got hot again out of the freezer, freezing pan into the fire. Um, so in Vancouver itself, there's some amazing statistics that have been worked out. So this is for 30 years from now. So we expect two times as many days over 25 degrees in the summer. And then they have this thing called tropical nights. If you've been to the tropics, you can relate to this, where it never gets below 20 degrees. So it could be four of those per year on average. Uh, greater, longer growing season and warmer, wetter winters with less snow, more frequent intense rain events and storms. And here are some of the temperature differences expected. So no matter what parameter you go to, it's going to be quite a bit higher 30 years from now. So um, you can just look at winter daytime highs, 5 to 7.4. Uh, winter lows, this could have effect all over the province of BC because there'll be less freezing in the winter. Um, so in the future, um, winter lows averaging only 1.9. And then there's the extreme events. This isn't for Metro Vancouver, but I like this graph because it shows all the kinds of events and how they're increasing over time. It only goes up to 2011. I need to get a new graph, but um, you just have to watch the news and watch the news of um, the wildfires in the last few weeks up the Pacific coast here. So that that's included in these extreme events as well as flooding, storms, all kinds of extreme events that are predicted as the average temperature goes higher, it will always increase these extreme events. And one place they saw this was Vermont. So in Vermont, we had tropical storm Irene and Brian Colloran was studying knotweed at the time, which is my favorite <laughs> weed to study. And he found that after the storms, the debris spread pieces of knotweed, which is what knotweed loves to be broken up into pieces. And people were trying to kind of clear the ground and so on. It was a perfect 
um, place for knotweed to flourish. So as we think about our future here with climate change, which future do we want? Do we want Minakata Regional Park? Here at least I'm going north of the Fraser. Um, I do make it there sometimes. Or uh, I don't want to put down a park, but um, actually I love this park because it's one of our research sites, but it's Douglas Taylor Park in Abbotsford where um, it's being pretty overrun by knotweed. And with these more extreme events, the weeds could become more of a problem. So we need a scene change from this Anthropocene. Uh, this is what uh, this prize winner says. It's a pity we're still officially living in an age called the Holocene. The Anthropocene, human dominance of biological, chemical, and geological processes on Earth, is already an undeniable reality. So how can we deal with this in the Metro Vancouver area? Um, as you can tell, I love parks, and I know all of you do too, and I think that's where a lot of the resilience could come. So when um, Melinda Young from Burnaby approached me with this idea to study the resilience in Central Park, I was thrilled. I thought this would be a great opportunity to see what we could actually do about these changes in climate. And so this is the team I assembled here. Um, these are my students um, going from uh, Delia, Vanessa, Virginia, Natalie, and Jessica. They just spent uh, eight months. They finished the report at the end of June doing this. Um, I guess I'll, oh, I, I'm supposed to uh, let someone in the waiting room here. I don't know if I can do that. Do, do, do. Anyway, I will. Um, so this park is really loved by the people of Burnaby and you can see why it's got some beautiful wetlands and beautiful forests and so Met, uh, Burnaby wants to keep it that way so this is from the article that was in the Burnaby now um, so we had these five researchers spending hours and they looked over 4,000 trees my students were going there every day, basically, and, and counting tr and looking at the tree health, measuring them, mapping them out. And they were led by um, Vanessa Jones here, who had graduated the year before, and she worked full time on this. So she was in the forest all the time. She says there are a lot of different factors that influence tree health, like disease, invasive plants, or soil compaction. However, all of these problems are exacerbated by the climate problem. And this is the word you hear a lot with climate change. It doesn't change things. It doesn't make something different. It exacerbates what's already happening. So if you have plant diseases, they're going to get worse. If you have invasive plant problems, they're going to get worse. And so she talks about the climate changes that are happening. And then she talks about what are we going to do about it. She says, restoring the forest with native plant species that are drought tolerant is one path. So these, these are some of the most important findings here. The three major conifer trees, which cover most of the park. Um, the good news was not all good. Actually, the news was better than we thought, maybe with cedars. Because if you've noticed driving around anywhere, you see some cedars dying. But in Central Park, we saw about 200 out of the 2,000 declining, and some were dead. But the, oh, sorry, that's all, that's everything, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so 56 declining out of 900, so not so bad. Um, but Western Hemlock was the big surprise. A lot of the Western Hemlocks were declining um, or already dead and, or had recently died. And here you can see a map showing the cedars in red and the hemlocks, all those yellow dots. These are the dead conifers in the park. So here's what happens with the cedars. Their fronds get brown like this. This tree is basically dead. But this tree is dying back from the crown. So it looks like it's pretty well doomed. And then this is a couple of dead hemlocks here. You can see they've got these galls on them so we sent the galls to be tested at the provincial plant diagnostic lab 
and there was no fungi and there was no insect evidence whatsoever so it seems like it's a function of the tree's physiology so it could be linked to climate change um, but certainly the amount of moisture we're getting in the last few years is bad for these trees because the spring moisture there's been a spring drought for like five years in a row this year it was pretty moist but the previous five years were pretty dry and it's affected the salal as well um, one thing with salal it likes to be in the shade and a lot of the salal in the park is out in the sunlight so they're getting these brown spots on them and then there's the soil itself we need the soil to be wet and central park is fairly high so it drains a lot and it also has all these unsanctioned trails so we decided to met to map the trails my students just love mapping and so they mapped all the unsanctioned trails and this is 11 kilometers of trails that are not part of the park system so the soil along all those trails gets compacted which is not good for the plant life and 15 percent higher compaction than unsanctioned than uh, natural soil so here we have the park in its current state so hopefully Burnaby will do something about these unsanctioned trails they already try to do some things but we identified it as a major problem this is Swan Guard Stadium by the way and then you've got the sky train going through as well there's also invasive species there there's 10 that are quite numerous and the ivy is all over the place so we're actually um, being funded by Burnaby to do a little bit more work on the invasive species right now so I've called back three of these researchers to uh, do some more research on what can be done about these in the face of climate change so we came up with these six recommendations at the end the first three were about taking care of things stewarding things and this, by the way, is a beautiful picture that I think Vanessa took one day in the, in the park there. So stewarding the ex existing conifers, um, as I said, they're in trouble, especially the hemlocks, trying to do what we can about those. Um, and then there's hardwoods as well that we also measured, not as many. Um, and the salal I mentioned. Then there's soil moisture. We've left five soil moisture probes to measure soil because, as I mentioned, we've had drought conditions lately in the spring um, we need better soil qual quality and restore things which might mean for the future planting different trees so I know in some areas they no longer plant cedar trees now because cedars are so vulnerable to dry conditions and maybe the same with hemlocks so it could be we have to plant Douglas firs instead of or hardwoods instead so it brings a big question as to what will become of Metro Vancouver in 2050. Do the few parks and the bogs have the resilience that we need? And I took this picture of a sap um, on a cedar tree in the Blau Eco Forest. And as, as the kind of closing thought here, can we catch creation's tears before they fall? I just, as soon as I saw that sap, I thought, Oh, that looks like a tear. I could probably take a picture and, <laughs> and use this as I communicate to people um, the sadness of the trees, really. Um, so that's the sad ending, but hopeful in terms of can we actually help some of this. And I want to finish by acknowledging all of these uh, funding sources and students. Um, these are all the students that I named in the talk here, but um, including the five here that are on the Burnaby project, um, but also thanks to the Blau family and especially thanks to Melinda Young and Kate Clark with the city of Burnaby that um, inspired us and, and gave us the funding to do this study and the Pacific Parklands Foundation that funded our Langley Bog work. So with that, I will uh, take your questions.